before we begin, I like to address the parents in the congregation. How many of you are parents here? Good, I'm one of them too. Now picture this. You have an 18-year-old daughter, and one day during dinner, she would say, Mom, Dad, I want to go to Rwanda for one year. Now, if you happen to be the parent, what would you do? No. <laughs> I will tell you my reaction. What Dr. Yu say, no, is just very, very mild. If it were to be me, I would say, xiao. <laughs> now, what would you do if you are 18 years old? Would you be xiao enough to go to Rwanda? And, and that was, what, six, seven years after the genocide? Or 15 years. But that is still a very, very traumatic experience. How many of you know about the genocide in uh, Rwanda? Right, for you who doesn't know or don't know, go into the back. And when I look at what was in there, I cried. But this little girl, this 18-year-old little girl, said that, Mom and Dad, I want to go to Rwanda. Now, why do you think that uh, the parents agreed? Very simple. The parents do not know how to say you xiao. So she was able to go. I'd like to introduce you, uh, this little girl. She's my niece. A uh, little girl, come. <laughs> lower, lower down a bit. Uh, this little girl uh, is no longer little. In a year's time, I have to call her Dr. Tama Gerber. I'm not going to waste too much time now. I, uh, you're supposed to have, what, half an hour to talk, but somebody said you can go on for one hour. Yeah. <laughs> no? Well, enjoy the talk, and I hope you'll be inspired, because actually, what I hope to see is that one of these days, you all have the opportunity, uh, opportunity not necessarily to go to places like Luanda, but to be a student missionary. It's a very rewarding experience. I'll tell you more about it later on. Tama? Hello, everybody. Hello. Wow, there are so many of you here tonight. I didn't expect so many people. And I'm especially glad that so many young people came. I mean, I can almost only see young people. There's a couple of older people, but <laughs> I'm very happy that all of you are here today and that you also came from different churches. Um, I really didn't expect that. Um, yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, my name is Tamar, and I'm originally from Switzerland. Um, I don't feel very Swiss, though, because up until five years ago, I never lived in Switzerland. <laughs> I was born and raised in Asia. I was born in South Korea, then I moved to Hong Kong, and then I moved to Singapore. And I grew up in Singapore. I did my high school in Singapore. And then I decided after high school that I wanted to take one year and do a student missionary year. Um, can I ask all of you, who is still in high school, who is doing their A-levels soon? Anybody? Or anybody below A-levels? So there's still quite a number of young people here who are not finished with school. Maybe after tonight, you will decide that you want to do one year of student missionary work after you finish school. Maybe not. Who knows? <laughs> So, um, I grew up in Singapore, um, I went to school there, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my year in Rwanda. When Uncle Ping Chong asked me to 
talk about my time in Rwanda, I really had to think hard because I was in Rwanda five years ago and I don't remember everything, but I still remember a little bit. Um, I brought a map for you tonight. Um, does anybody know where Rwanda is? Nobody knows? Uh, wait. Ah. No, so, okay. So this is a map of Africa. <laughs> I hope you recognize that. Um, <laughs> Rwanda is a very tiny country in the east of Africa. Uh, here. It's actually so small you can't really see it on the map. <laughs> Um, here is Tanzania, right next to it is one small country, and that is Rwanda. Before tonight, has anybody of you heard of Rwanda? Yeah. So probably all of you know Rwanda, um, that there was a genocide there. Maybe some of you weren't born during the genocide yet. I was very small. I was only four years old when the genocide happened. So I didn't um, hear much about the genocide until I was a little bit older. Now, I know Rwanda as a place which is very beautiful and it has very beautiful people and it's a beautiful country. If you go there today, you see remains of the genocide, but what you see especially is very happy people, of course there are sad people, but there are a lot of friendly and open people who are trying to look into the future and not um, look in the past to the genocide. So I brought you some pictures tonight, so hopefully you'll stay awake. Um, and so you can kind of imagine the place and see where I spent one year of my life. Um, I want to tell you how it came that I went to Rwanda. I knew from quite a young age that, well, quite a young age, I was maybe in middle school, grade eight or grade nine, where I knew that I, I wanted to study medicine. And Africa has always fascinated me as a continent. Um, and. I read lots of books and stories about missionaries in Africa, missionaries in other countries, and I was very fascinated and I, well, I wanted to be a missionary. And so I thought, well, I could be a doctor and I could be a um, missionary doctor. So I took all of the necessary classes in high school so that I could be a doctor, but after I was, about to finish high school, I wasn't sure if I should really go into medicine, if I really wanted to be a missionary doctor. Um, so I decided I don't want to start medical school if I'm not 100% sure that I want to be a doctor. Because medical school is hard. And it's a long, long, time until you're finally finished. I'm studying medicine in Switzerland at the moment, and my degree is six years. So it's, if you don't really want to study medicine, then you shouldn't study medicine for six years and then decide, oh, I don't want to be a doctor. So I decided before I go to medical school, I really want to know if I want to be a doctor. And since I wanted to be, since I want to be a missionary doctor in the future, I decided why not go to a hospital in Africa and see if I would like to be a missionary doctor. Now, it's not very easy to go to Africa as a high school student with no degree and go to a hospital and say, hello, I'm here, I would like to help. Um, because there's not much that you can do as an 18 year old with no medical knowledge. Um, I had some contacts 
in Africa. I know some medical doctors here and there. So I sent them some emails and I said, I would like to come and spend one year at your hospital. Is it possible? And I got a lot of very discouraging replies. They said, oh, we're very sorry, but there's nothing that an 18-year-old with no medical knowledge can, can do at our hospital. We won't have any work for you. Um, and they also said, it's very difficult for a girl in Africa. People won't accept you. So I was very discouraged. Um, I didn't know what to do. And my parents said, we know one medical surgeon. He's working in Nepal. It's not Africa. But why don't you try go to Nepal instead of Africa? So I was not very happy about that. But I decided since none of the other hospitals in Africa wanted to take me, or they had no job for me, which I understood, um, I, would go, I would try and go to Nepal instead. Um, I was very fortunate growing up because my parents really encouraged me to do a student missionary year after high school. I'm the youngest of three children and my brother did a student missionary year in Cambodia. My sister did a student missionary year in India and by the time it was my turn, they already had practice so they weren't too scared anymore. So they suggested I go to Nepal and I sent um, my parents' friends, they met this surgeon in Ethiopia 20 years ago, and they hadn't seen him since, but they still had email contact with him. So um, they gave me his email address, and I sent him an email, and I said, hello, um, you don't know me, but you know my parents, and um, I want to come and volunteer at your hospital for one year, if that's possible. I think it only went one or two days, and I got a reply from this doctor. Do you know what he said? Can anybody guess what he said? Yes. yes. But then I would have gone to Nepal, right? But I didn't go to Nepal. <laughs> no. So his, his email was very surprising. I was very surprised. And I think, I, I don't remember praying about this, but I think God, he just, gave me what I wanted, even though I didn't explicitly ask him. But this surgeon, he replied and he said, oh, we're so sorry, we're not in Nepal anymore. We are in Rwanda now. Would you like to come to Rwanda? Can you imagine how happy I was? <laughs> um, he mentioned in his email, well, we know you wanted to go to Nepal and Africa is not Nepal. So if you don't want to come here, we understand. I immediately replied and I said, no, I would love to come to Africa. So um, that's how I got the opportunity to go to Rwanda. Um, yeah, it's really funny because I think God knew that he wanted me in Africa. and. Even though I don't remember asking him, he, he still gives us sometimes what we really want. And it's just so amazing sometimes to see how blessed we are and how God, he just, sometimes he just gives us a present. So, I knew I could go to Rwanda. Now I just had to tell my parents. Um, so one day at the dinner table, I told my parents, um, I got a reply from that surgeon and he's in Rwanda. He, can, he said, I can come to Rwanda for one year. Actually, I don't remember if my parents were worried because they were very cool about it. They said, okay, if you want to do that, um, you can go. And about six months later, I was packing my bag. So before I 
continue, I want to tell you a little bit about Rwanda. Um, Rwanda is a tiny country, like we saw on the map. It is one of the smallest countries in Africa, and it's one of the most densely populated in Africa. There are people everywhere. And it's very hilly. There's a lot of hills, and it's very green. Um, it really is a beautiful country. And most people, when they think of Africa, they think of desert and lions and zebras, and that it's hot and sticky. But Rwanda, it can get hot and sticky, but it's very cool because there's a lot of hills. And there's beautiful mountains, and there's also gorillas. So if anybody wants to go to Rwanda, I can really um, recommend it to you. <laughs> there are a lot of people, and the people, they are mostly very friendly. This picture was actually taken when our car broke down. And our wheel, well, our wheel burst. Actually, the wheel, we saw the wheel rolling down the hill. And within five minutes, we had attracted a huge crowd. And all of these people, they came to help. Well, the older people came to help, the kids came to watch. And there were mothers with their babies, and everybody was there trying to help us somehow. Most of them were just there to look at the Muzungu, which is Angmo in Kenya, Rwanda. Um, and so they're very friendly people. The place where I was staying was four hours outside of the capital city. I was staying in a very ulu ulu ulu, ulu place. Um, this is the capital of Rwanda. This is Kigali. Um, when I wanted to go to the hospital, I had to come to this place. Well, I had to come to this place. It's the bus terminal. I had to hop into one of these small minivans. And I had to drive for three hours on a paved road. It was semi-paved. Sometimes there were big holes. And then these mini buses, they're not like here in Malaysia. They fit maybe 20 people inside one minibus or more. So everybody's very cramped. And you drive like that. Maybe you have this much space to sit, and your bag is on top. And you drive like that for three hours. After reaching, um, after reaching a smaller town three hours outside of the capital, I had to change either onto another minibus or onto this big bus, which was also crammed with people. And I had to drive another one hour on a very bumpy dirt road to the hospital. And then from this road, I had to walk all the way up the hill to the hospital. So the hospital was very far away. And it was, it was a beautiful place. But yeah, there was not much there. There was just the hospital and people. The hospital I spent um, my student missionary year at was called Muganero Hospital. It's located um, on a hill. And Below the hills is a big lake, and it's very beautiful. Um, so when I arrived at Muganero Hospital, well, actually, before I arrived, um, I received an email from Silas, and he said that the government in Rwanda had changed the official language from French to English. Um, so before 2009, the official language in Rwanda was French. Not a lot of people spoke French, even though it was the official language. Most of the people spoke Kenya Rwanda, which is the local language. But so 
January 1st, 2009, everybody in the office, in the hospital, in the schools, they all had to speak English. Now, that's a very difficult task. If nobody knows how to speak English, who is going to teach the people English there? So Silas had sent me an email and he said, your English is good, right? Why don't you teach the hospital staff some English? So I was happy that before I went there, I already knew that I had one task. I knew that I would be teaching English. And I would be teaching English to the hospital staff, people who are older than me, which was very frightening somehow. And I was very nervous. But I prepared myself. I even visited an English teaching class before I went. And I bought some books to help me teach English there. And I flew to Rwanda. Now, the English class that I taught was once a, week, uh, once a day in the evenings. So the hospital workers would go to work in the morning, and they would teach an English class in the evening. And the English class would last maybe one hour to one and a half hours, depending on the attention of the students. So during the day, I had the opportunity to help out in the hospital. Well, at the beginning, I didn't do much helping. At the beginning, I did a lot of watching and learning. This was the hospital that I spent at. Um, as that I spent my student missionary year at. It was a relatively big hospital, actually. It had 100 beds. Um, there was a internal medicine department, a pediatrics ward, which, which is just one room, so it wasn't really a ward. Um, there was a surgical department, and there was a maternity department. Oh, and there was also an ICU. They had an x-ray, and they had a lab, and they had an AIDS center. So actually, there were a lot of, oh, they even had a, um, a dentist at the hospital. This is an Adventist hospital, right? Yes, this is an Adventist hospital. So they actually had a lot of different, um, different services at the hospital. Everything from dentistry to maternity to ICU. Um, this was the main building of the hospital where internal medicine and surgery was and on this side was the gynecology ward. Um, the hospital had an ambulance, which is at the far back, the jeeps. They would go to the neighboring villages and they would pick up the patients from the villages there. Um, there was also a church in the hospital. And yeah. Oh, okay. So the hospital had a lot of different services. And um, the first couple of weeks when I was there, I was just able to look into the different services. I was able to go to internal medicine. I was able to go to surgery. I was able to watch a lot of surgeries. I could go to every single surgery if I wanted to. I could go to the maternity ward. I could go to the lab. And um, I learned a lot during that one year. Many people, a lot of my friends, they said, why do you want to take one year of your life and just waste it? Why, why do you want to go and go somewhere where you don't learn anything, where you don't do anything when you could be at university studying. And I'm very glad that I did a student missionary year because um, I learned so much in that year. The nurses and the doctors, they were so helpful and they wanted to teach me everything that they knew. I taught them English, I taught them what I knew, and they taught me what they knew. And during medical school, of course, I didn't always understand the cases that came into the hospital. But during medical school, um, we would often read on, up on cases or we'd have cases in lectures. And 
I'd remember, oh, that patient in Rwanda, he had that. So it's very, it, it was very rewarding to see that even during that one year where I could have been in university studying, I still learned a little bit, even though I only learned the theory after I went to university. Um, so when I was at the hospital, I started to kind of rotate in services. I would spend one week at maternity and then I would go one week into the lab and I got to see a lot of different things. I even got to help um, do a couple of night shifts and um, help the nurses in maternity ward. Yeah, so there's so much to learn and so much to see. Um, the place where I was staying, it was very far away from the capital and there was not very much food. So before we, we would take a trip, we would go to the capital city every once in a while to buy beans and rice and food so we could eat back at the hospital. So there's, these are just a couple of pictures um, what Rwanda is like. Um, the, the hospital that I was at, it was an Adventist hospital. It was actually a big campus. There was a hospital, there was a school, a primary school, a secondary school, and there was a health center. And the campus had three churches. So this was the biggest church. It was, we called it the mother church. Um, it stood on a hill, and it's actually quite funny, this church, it was, one day it was there, and the next day it was gone, <laughs> because they had just tore it down overnight, which was very strange, but they started building it up again, so, yeah. This was the secondary school church. Now, this church has um, a very sad story. During the genocide in 1994, um, a lot of, wait, I'll tell you a little bit about the genocide in case you don't know what happened, but there's two different um, ethnic groups in Rwanda. There are the Hutus and there are the Tutsis. The, during the genocide, the Hutus tried to eradicate the Tutsis. So they tried to um, kill all of the Tutsis. This church played a big part in the Rwandan genocide. During the genocide, um, a lot of Tutsis, they went to this church to seek refuge because a church is a house of refuge and they thought they would be safe. They had even the pastor I'm not sure if it was a pastor, but somebody who attended this church told all of them, you can go into the church, you'll be safe. And so a lot of people hid in the church and then somebody called the rebels and they said, I have one group of, I have a big group of Tutsis hiding in the church. And the rebels came and they killed everybody. So it's a very, very, um, yeah, it was a very touching story and a very sad memory. Um, and this church was actually not renovated after the genocide. So if you look closely, I'm not good, I'm not sure how good the picture quality is. At the back, oh, at the back of the, wall, you can actually still see bullet holes um, from during the genocide. So Muganero Hospital, it was very badly affected during the genocide. Also the hospital was badly affected and um, there, were, there were survivors, but the survivors they, most of them, they lost all of their families. And while I was there, I made a lot of friends and um, some of the hospital workers, they opened up to me. 
and they started telling me of their, their stories. And the things they went through, I can't imagine what they went through. But um, it was very touching how people, I was, I was there, I was a Muzungu, a Angmo, I was there only for nine months, but I was very touched to see how people accepted me and how they opened up to me and how they shared a part of their life with me. They even told me that I have to learn their language. <laughs> and so some of them, in return for me giving them English classes, they would give me Kenya Rwanda cl classes. And they were all very lovely people. Um, OK, I'm going to jump over these pictures quickly. So I just wanted to show you some pictures about hospital, what the hospital was like. Um, towards the end of the, my time in Rwanda, I realized that I was very interested in surgery. And I spent a lot of time in the surgical ward. And um, this man on the left, his name is Silas. He's a Brazilian um, surgeon. He's a missionary doctor. He was a missionary doctor in Ethiopia, Malawi, Nepal, everywhere. And um, his wife is a scrub nurse. And a lot of the nurses at the hospital, they don't have a very, well, they do have a nursing education, but it's not very high quality. It's not a very good education that they get. And none of them are trained in surgery. I'll just. None of them are trained in surgery. So um, Eunice, the scrub nurse, she had to train lots of nurses to help out in the OR. And I was very fortunate because while I was there, she was training a new nurse to become a scrub nurse. And I was able to learn with the, the other nurse. And she taught me how to scrub. She taught me the names of the surgical instruments. and. So I learned a lot through what she taught me. Um, this was in maternity ward. It was a C-section, and that was the baby. Um, so at the end of my time in Rwanda, um, Silas allowed me to scrub in one surgery because he realized that I was picking up um, what Eunice was teaching me very fast. And he said um, that he thought I was ready to help out in one surgery. Of course, this sounds, I don't tell anybody at university this because they would all get a heart attack if they heard this. Because I, I'm not trained, I wasn't trained back then, I was just a student. Um, but in many ways, I knew about as much as the nurses there. So, um, they, they taught me a lot and they helped me, they gave me such great opportunities. Um, when I was in Rwanda, I was the only student missionary. Actually, this position was especially created for me. <laughs> there had been no other student missionary in that hospital before. And, um, a lot of people, they would say, oh, I want to go and do a student missionary year with my friends. I don't want to go alone, but maybe I'm very antisocial, but I was very happy that I could go on my own. Um, because I got to know the people in a different way. If you go with a friend, it's good if you go with a friend. If you're not, if you don't think you can go on your own, then it's good if you do a student missionary year with with your friends. But if you dare to go on your own, then there's so much that you can experience um, compared to if you go with a friend. Um, because I spent a lot of time with the local people there. And I even joined a um, singing choir. They sang all of their songs in Kenya, Rwanda, um, which was a bit difficult at first. But I learned through that, through singing songs, I learned the language pretty fast. And um, 
people, they were, they invited me to their homes and they, they were very open and I think if I would have gone with a friend, I would have been together with my friend, stuck all the time, and I probably wouldn't have made as many friends in Rwanda as I did. Um, I still have, I'm still in contact with a lot of the people there. So it's, you meet people that you'll never see again, but that every once in a while they'll say, hey, I'm getting married, do you want to come to my wedding? And every time I get an email like that, I'm always very touched how they still remember me. I mean, I was just an 18-year-old girl teaching a little bit of English. Um, yeah, so my year in Rwanda was, I could tell you a lot of stories, but um, I don't know, I would ramble on and on. So I won't continue on about Rwanda, but it was a very, it was a very blessed time that I could experience there. And um, I'm very glad that, that I did do a student missionary trip. 